Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship. My name is Stacey Benjamin, and I'm the Associate Director of Relations for Minority Serving Institutions at CIEE, as well as the Director of the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship. I'm also an alum. The first time I left the country was with CIEE as a participant in the Work in Britain program. That summer of 1991 definitely changed my life for the better. And I'm so grateful for the experience and that I now get to encourage others to take advantage of these opportunities. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. If we could go to the next slide. We'll start with greetings from CIEE's president and CEO, Dr. Jim Pello. Leadership matters, and there would be no Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship without this leader who was determined to keep this program going even as we weathered a pandemic. And I'm excited that we'll have a chance to learn more about Dr. Be Dr. Pello's vision for it. Next, we'll hear from Colin McElroy, our Director of Health, Safety, and Security. Before coming to CIEE, Mr. McElroy spent 13 years working for the Army in various roles, advising foreign security forces with two deployments in Iraq, so he knows a fair bit about managing risk. And we know that many of you have questions about how CIEE has managed to run programs during these times. So we thought it would be helpful for you to hear from him. Next slide, please. We'll then have the pleasure of a presentation from Frederick Douglass Global Fellow, Frederick Uy. In addition to being a fellow, Frederick is also an Honors College Presidential Scholar and a Washington State Opportunity Scholar at Claflin University where he's earning two degrees, one in finance and one in computer science. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about his journey on the fellowship. And lastly, I'll come back to share a few tips for the application, and then we'll open it up for questions. So with that, I pass the mic to Dr. Pella. Thank you, Stacy, And good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have a really great turnout. There's over 100 of you joining us uh, this, this afternoon. And uh, we expect more to join uh, as the hour rolls on. So thank you for carving out some, some of your day for us. Um, my name, uh, as Stacy said, is Jim Pello. I come to you uh, as the head of this organization for the last 10 years. Prior to that, I worked for 20 years in New York City at a university, St. John's University, which was a minority serving institution located in Queens and Staten Island and Manhattan, uh, New York. Uh, and it's there that I learned about the importance of access and opportunity and the importance of overcoming barriers to education. Uh, things like cost, things are expensive and the importance of getting the right courses and the importance of driving a culture that embraces education. Uh, and it was about 10 years into my experience at St. John's uh, when I was introduced to international education. I, I had never studied abroad as a student. I was a, a Pell student. I was from a big family and Nobody in my family uh, went to school or studied abroad. Um, and it was only after I was a professional and had the chance to go to graduate school and study abroad where I learned how important that experience was. Uh, it is life-changing. It is everything that uh, we present and your peers and your faculty advisors present uh, to you. It's, it's really uh, like nothing you can describe uh, in terms of opening your eyes. If you think about it, it's like climbing a mountain. If you're at the top of the mountain, you can really see uh, the world through a different lens than being down lower on the mountain. And so if you think about study abroad as, as climbing a mountain, I am uh, appearing here on the screen with someone who has climbed many mountains. This is Nettie Washington Douglas. She is the great, great granddaughter of uh, Booker T. Washington and the great, great, great granddaughter of Frederick Douglas. It was her generation that actually brought together those two iconic families of um, uh, anti-slavery abolitionists, uh, social justice advocates, uh, Booker T and Frederick Douglass. Uh, and she is a giant uh, in terms of her world experience. She has been around the world uh, many times. She has advocated on behalf of social change initiatives as the head of the Frederick Douglass Family uh, Initiative, uh, an organization housed in her hometown in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I met uh, Nettie in the oddest of ways. And I'm gonna tell you the story because to me, it's a story of destiny. It's a story that for us at CIEE uh, argues strongly that this program is special 
in a way that none of us can describe. Uh, the story goes back um, about five or six years. I was working with an old professor. I had gone to graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was working with a professor. We were on the phone. We had decided to work together to promote international education for students of color. Why? Because students of color are, are dramatically underrepresented in an experience that is transformational for the person and helps every student um, do better in school, graduate more quickly, and actually obtain better employment or better, better graduate school placements. There's lots of research on how important this experience is. Uh, we were working together because my professor, um, uh, former professor, uh, Dr. Gassman, uh, was the founder of the Center for Minority Serving Institutions at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, where I did my graduate work. And she and I decided that what we needed to do is come together. She had a lot of research money. She had connections with college presidents. She had connections with the minority serving institutions across the country. And I was uh, the leader of an organization that had the largest study abroad footprint. We were in 65 different cities and 40 countries. And we were committed. In fact, we were founded to provide access to all students from all backgrounds back in 1947 is when we were founded. So. We had a purpose, a defining purpose. She had a commitment to access. And we decided that a fellowship was the way to go, that we wanted to develop something that provided a completely free opportunity for students to embrace an international experience uh, in a context that mattered. And we developed a leadership program that talked about the importance of being change agents and advocates of positive change, developing the skills that would help you do that in your lives, wherever you wind up in your lives. Uh, but we couldn't decide on what to call it. We were debating on what to name this, this fellowship. And as it turns out, uh, I was traveling one day and I bumped into a bookstore and on the bookstore shelf was a book. And you can see me in the photo holding that book. Now, like many of you, I read this book when I was in junior high. Uh, it had been many years since I read it, but for some reason it jumped off the shelf. I grabbed the book, it was in a train station somewhere, and I threw it in my bag, and I didn't read it until two weeks later, right before I called Mary Beth Gaspin, and we needed to come up with a final name for the fellowship. I decided that based on Frederick's story, which I was reminded as I read the book again, that this was the guy we needed to name the fellowship after. This was an individual who taught himself to read, who uh, escaped from slavery, who spoke eloquently around the Northeast, who wrote an autobiography, uh, which became an international bestseller instantly, and who needed to leave America because his slave owners, who still legally had the right to his ownership in those days, were pursuing him. They were upset with the book. So he fled to Europe. He went to um, um, England, first of all, and then over to Ireland, Dublin in 1845, and he was only going to spend a day uh, or a couple of days in Dublin. He wound up spending four months in Ireland, uh, touring and speaking, and that's where he met uh, an individual named Daniel O'Connell, who at the time was the world's leading abolitionist. He was world famous for fighting for anti-slavery initiatives as well as other social justice initiatives. Frederick met Daniel, who was an older gentleman. Frederick is 27 years old, young kid, really. And they became instant friends. Frederick learned from Daniel uh, about the importance and the power of speaking and advocating for nonviolent social change, uh, for discipline and determination, patience, uh, and it changed his life. Changed his life in many ways. First, he stayed in Europe for two years, 1845 to 1847. He met a lot of people that became lifelong friends. Those people helped to purchase his freedom legally. And so when he returned to the US in 1847, he was a free man. We like to see that story through the lens of what we do, which is knowing that when you travel abroad, no matter how long you stay, whether it's four weeks or two years, you will be changed. You'll come back a different person. You'll have met people that would become lifelong friends. You will have skills and experiences that will, um, that will enhance your lives no matter what you do in your life. 
Um, and I swing back to that critical moment where we didn't know what to name this uh, and why I say this is a program of destiny. Uh, Mary Beth and I, we were, uh, we were debating and she's like, we cannot use the name. We do not have permission to use the name Frederick Douglass. And I said, Mary Beth, we have to use the name. It's the best name. This is the guy we need to, to hold up as an icon, as a role model. Listen, I said, if we get sued by the family, I'll, I'll pay for the lawyers to, to, and we'll beg for forgiveness. We'll, we'll move forward and we'll, we'll, we'll ask permission later, which I'm not recommending you folks do in any of your professional experiences, but we were desperate. Um, we needed to get this out the next day. And just as we were debating on a speakerphone, this conversation, a voice came from behind Mary Beth. And the voice uh, was a young woman who, uh, her name was Amanda, and Mary Beth said, hi, Amanda, what, what's going on? And Amanda said, uh, Professor Gassman, I understand that you're trying to uh, get a hold of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. Um, and Mary Beth said, yes, that's true. And she said, would you like me to call my Aunt Nettie? And we both fell out of our chairs. We couldn't believe that Aunt Nettie, right here in the photo, her niece was a graduate school going for her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. She was a graduate student of Mary Beth Gassman's. And so we of course said, of course, please call Aunt Nettie. And within minutes, she came back and Aunt Nettie said, of course, we would like to partner with Penn and with CIE. And we would love to embrace the notion of a fellowship in honor of Frederick Douglass. Uh, so if that isn't fate moving us in this direction, and if that doesn't demonstrate to you that this is a program of destiny and that you as applicants, as potential fellows or scholars, uh, potential individuals who will walk in the footsteps of Frederick Douglass overseas and experience what he experienced, if that's not a message and a signal, I don't, I don't know what is. And there's many, many other little stories along the way as we've built this program. But I'm gonna close there by saying um, what I said at the beginning. Thank you for your time and interest. Congratulations to you. I'm sure all of you have done amazing things in your lives. Uh, and we really look forward to you uh, completing your applications, to reviewing your applications and your short videos to get to know you uh, and to select uh, the next cohort of the Frederick Douglass Global Fellows who will be joined in Ireland with top individuals of the Irish government who have offered to co-sponsor this year's cohort because they want to celebrate the 175th anniversary of that famous meeting between Frederick and Daniel O'Connell. So thank you for your time and interest. Congratulations on all the things you've done. Please ask questions or ask for help in completing your applications. We look forward to reviewing them on Frederick's birthday, which is February 14th, right around the corner. With that, I'm going to turn it over to a, a graduate and alumni of the Frederick Douglass Global Fellows Program, Frederick, who is going to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, nope, I'm sorry, I have my order of events out. Um, one of the things that we predict you'll ask about is safety because of COVID. So our first speaker after me is Colin McElroy, who is an expert at understanding and mapping and measuring daily uh, the health and safety of all of our locations around the world. And he's gonna give us a brief overview of how we'll measure and track safety to ensure that uh, you on program uh, will be in safe uh, hands and in good hands uh, as you proceed through the fellowship. Uh, Colin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate the intro and uh, everyone, and thank you, that was a great story. Definitely hard to follow and now we'll talk the, um, what everybody is tracking around the world as the pandemic. Uh, we can go to the next slide here. But again, I'm Colin McElroy, I'm the Director of Health, Safety and Security for CIE. Um, I'm just going to briefly go because I want to, obviously we want to get to the other parts of the presentation here uh, and the discussion and Q&A, but I wanted to briefly describe to you because we anticipated questions of what CIE has been doing and will continue to be doing for uh, mitigation and response to COVID-19 and how we're operating successful study abroad programs uh, of all different types um, in, in this pandemic world that could last for quite some time. Uh, of course, these fundamentals, these are the fundamentals of prevention here. You've seen these, or they're at your colleges, or at your schools, or they're promoted by the CDC and the ECDC and the World Health Organization. These are simple 
things that we've seen. Some are more effective than others. Certainly, we're certain to see that um, surface transmission uh, is of less uh, importance than airborne. So ventilation is key. Social distancing is key. Uh, face coverings are key. And but I want to I want to for whatever program you may be looking at for whenever you're studying abroad or, or doing the fellowship. Um, that these protocols, I wanted to pause and say, these protocols are gonna be in place for quite some time. I think that we should all just kind of wrap our heads around that. Um, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I'm sure this will come up, the vaccines. Um, the vaccines, uh, I think it's safe to say the global rollout has been a lot slower than we would have liked and is, uh, is going pretty bumpy. And we have, uh, you know, in the US and Europe and elsewhere, and we're even seeing a number of countries who have no vaccinations at this point and won't have some for quite some time. And without uh, a global vaccination success rate at about 70% and getting some level of herd or umbrella immunity, uh, it's still gonna pose a danger pretty much everywhere, even with vaccinations. Uh, we've got the variants to consider and the variants may come up here as we're talking about Ireland in particular too. Uh, the variants are going to cause a cat and mouse uh, game between the vaccinations and the mutations as they happen. So obviously, Dr. Fauci said it the other day, the faster you can get the vaccinations out, the less variants we're going to see. And of course, there's been thousands of variants of COVID uh, as it's mutated, but there's these few that are of concern. And we, we don't want to see more of concern come out that may be more infectious, may be more lethal, and there's, the studies are still out on that. Uh, but you know, these are things that we, we're, we're constantly looking at. And let's, let's be clear on what we know about the vaccines. What can they do and what can't they do? Uh, the vaccines, we certainly know that there's a number of them, can certainly prevent somewhere in the range of 70 to 95% prevent serious illness, and that's good. Uh, there's still maybe some mild to moderate illness, uh, but what they can't do is, is guarantee it. And we also don't know, and so we have to assume, and, and with some of the vaccinations, it is the same way, you still may be able to get infected with it and you still may be able to pass it. Now, we don't know to what level yet. That will take time to figure out as they did these uh, vaccinations very quickly and studies very quickly, they, they were limited in what they could know, but they were focused on the safety and what the, what the um, safety risk was once you got the vaccine. So these are things to think about, but these mitigations, I say that all because these mitigations will be in place for quite some time. Uh, so I can safely say for this year, we're still going to be seeing this probably in the next year. Um, and there may be some variations in different countries of, of how, it's, how it's measured, but we're, we're going to continue to see these. If we can go to the next slide. And this is just another way of looking at it. You may have seen this in, in a, a number of articles in the newspaper. I think I saw it in the New York Times. Uh, the Swiss cheese model was just another way of talking about all of the, the uh, mitigation measures to prevent COVID. And all it was simply saying is that nothing is foolproof. No one measure is foolproof. So uh, masks are not 100% effective. Uh, surface cleaning is not 100%. Physical distancing is not 100% because it is airborne, it can go further. So there's holes in various defenses that we have, but you take this stack, you put it together, you get a pretty good defense. And this is what, and I say this all because this is what our whole program model is, uh, is well, our program is modeled on uh, going forward for the foreseeable future. In, in pandemic proofing our companies and our, uh, our, our programs. We go to the next slide. And this is, so we talked about mitigation. Now I'm just gonna talk response really quickly. This is our, this is our uh, COVID-19 response protocol for participants and staff. And there's a lot going on here, but basically just showing this to show that we've, we, we have tested protocols. So, and I'll talk about that here in a second. We have tested these protocols. We came out with them last summer for our fall and now our spring programs. Uh, and looked at every eventuality we could for a positive test of a staff or student, uh, a direct exposure through contact tracing, or someone with symptoms. And there's some minor variations here, such as if you have symptoms and following the CDC guidance that you would be isolated for 10 days, as opposed to a direct exposure or a positive test that might be for 14 days. And it has the actions on here are on how CIE supports uh, the students to get through those quarantines or isolations as necessary. And exposures will happen from time to time. I, we, we've seen some. And it's important that we expect it and expect the worst so that we can respond to it. And that's what I'll talk about on the next slide. So how does it work to date? Um, so we've had programs through fall and now spring. We've had 2,400 participants uh, abroad in one fashion or another, uh, whether it's college away or traditional study abroad, and it's been in 17 different countries. So we've seen it in, in different variations, different levels of risk. And that's something we measure is each country's level of risk by COVID-19. And out of those 2,400 participants, we've only had about nine uh, positive cases. 
And we've been very surprised in some cases when large groups came from the US and all tested negative. And then we'd have a small group come from the US and one or two would test positive. Uh, but the, the key thing was catching those early and catching them early on, isolating, contact rate tracing, and already having our facilities set up so you know, they would have a single room, they would already be ready for a quarantine. Our staff was there to support them. And so the, the overall um, bottom line up front here is the, the mitigations were successful and adopted. Uh, we've, we've been really impressed with the students in the fall and now the spring in not only trying to prevent COVID through the, through the mitigation measures, but when, when, a, when a, an infection does pop up that we're able to quickly uh, get their cooperation and isolate contact trace and ensure that the, the students can have a successful end of program. And we've seen that. We have a couple of students go into quarantine and then they've come out and they finished their program successfully. And in that particular group, they were extremely very careful after that first isolation, uh, but no negative outcomes. And we've been really happy with the student support. And we have them have everyone sign. We would ask you to sign a social contract with us. And it's just to, and our staff do it as well. It's just that we are all responsible. We're all in this together, as Dr. Fauci said. So, um, you know, that's something that's very important. And we'll go to the final slide, I believe. And this slide, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, uh, but I'll just try to guide you through it really quickly. Uh, this is new cases in the past two weeks per 100,000 population. So this is the new COVID infections adjusted for population so we can make it an apples to apples comparison. And this is from the 25th of January. And actually, I just looked at it today, uh, it's 27th, and it's already changed in, in some ways for the better uh, for what I wanted to talk about here. Um, what, you'll, what you're looking at here is you're seeing the United States average of uh, infections in every two weeks. Uh, is the line in red and green is the CIE countries that we operate in Ireland and UK included and then the compared against the US states as countries and that's pretty comparable in some cases and again we are adjusting for population and what we've seen tr throughout this experience is for the most part the uh, there's been a, a sea of blue on the right hand side there throughout this pandemic throughout the fall especially and now into the spring to some degree uh, the, the sea of blue on the right hand side whereas our countries have sat very happy to see that on more the left side, the low end with China being at the very bottom there. The top country now just hit is now Portugal at the very top, followed closely by Arizona and South Carolina. Uh, you'll see some other CIE countries up there. It's Czech Republic, Spain, who has been having some spikes lately, and England and Ireland. And I just checked now, England and Ireland uh, fell right below the US today. So we've seen England and Ireland going in the right direction. So I was glad to see them fall. We're keeping a very close eye on Spain. Uh, the Czech Republic and Portugal. And this is only one measure. There, there's other things we look at, such as hospital capacity and other measurements. And there's definitely different ways to cut this, but this has been a very positive, uh, a very powerful tool for us to see, to, get, to have a snapshot of what's going on right now and what's the trend of that country. And then again, the, the kind of the key takeaway here uh, for everyone on the call is we need to look at risk as very nuanced. Uh, so, you know, you have to look at where you are and where you're going and look at your hometown, look at your home state, look at your home institution if you're gonna to go to class there, and then look at the destination abroad. And, and this is a pandemic, there's risk is everywhere. So there's, there's a risk of staying and there's a risk of going, and that's a little simplified, but not oversimplified. So that you have to take a look. So if you are in Arizona and you may want to go to the Netherlands, it is a drastic uh, difference here on this chart. Uh, and you would wanna take a look at your home state and your hometown as well. Uh, but that's something to take a look at. And we, we put these charts on, on our web frequently uh, so you can follow along there. But I, I encourage you to continue to follow the numbers on a number of sites out there, such as Johns Hopkins, to really compare the risk and to look at your personal risk threshold, how you and your family may be approaching the pandemic and what mitigations you're taking and how you can be safe abroad by uh, using all the mitigations we've talked about here. And again, where you may be coming from, where you're going, it might be much less risky. So I'll, I'll try to avoid the word saying this is safe and this is not safe. I'll say less risky and more risky because risk is everywhere. But, and I hope that addressed most of your issues and I think I've taken too much time and I will pass this on to Frederick. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Awesome, so pretty much I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Frederick Uy, and I am a third year student at Claflin University in South Carolina, double majoring in finance and computer science. And most of all, I am a 2019 Frederick Douglass Global Fellow. 
So a little bit about me is last summer, I have worked in Oracle and Dominion Energy, which are both technology and energy companies respectively. And currently, I am working as part of the audit team with Dixon Huge Goodman, which is a top 20 accounting firm and a financial analyst with Kinship. And this summer, I have an internship lined up with Nestle or Bank of America. So before the fellowship, I would also like to mention that I was very lost in my identity or in my finding my own personal identity. I was born in the Philippines and pretty much grew up there for most of my life, but didn't really felt proud about it, sadly. Then at around 2015, my family and I moved to Washington and loved the people. I resonated with the people, but there is a strong language and cultural barrier since pretty much back then, that was literally my first time speaking English, and it was very difficult to overcome. And when I was just starting to adjust, again, I had to move to South Carolina for college. And again, another huge change, the Southern accent, the very different geographic culture. And once again, I was lost in finding my own place. I was lost in finding my own identity that I can proudly resonate with. So moving forward, you know, during the fellowship, it was it was the greatest moment in my life, pretty much. Because not it not only it allowed me to study abroad on the summer of my freshman year or as a rising sophomore, which is a huge achievement, it also connected me to a lot of people who have dreams of changing the world, starting by with their own communities. And that was really inspirational. But most of all, it allowed me to dig deeper and reconnect with my own Filipino roots by meeting a lot of Filipino people in Earl's Court. Pretty much Earl's Court. Earl's Court is a place in London where there is like a ton of Filipino community where like there's a lot of Filipino restaurants and it was great. So how did it happen is pretty much how it happened was that my aunt texted me uh, that there was actually a friend of my late grandma in London so how it happened was that I met up with her. Um, she was this old, wise lady. She's around 75 years old, still strong, and she was great. When I met up with her, she told me about the stories of her role in the community by cultivating the Filipino community around London and how they were able to build it from scratch and the challenges that they've experienced, the most recent accomplishments that they have witness and so much more and after that i felt really inspired and I, it led for me to appreciate my culture a lot more and i was like you know what i should actually be really proud of this because it makes up a huge part of my own identity so before going back or before going back to the united states i told myself that i want to continue what I felt on that exact same day, or pretty much what I felt during the exact same span, during the span of the fellowship. I told myself that I would love to do it again and spread it around my campus community, the feelings of fortitude, you know, the feelings of inspiration, full of passion. In fact, I also made promises with a bunch of other fellows or what I'd like to call them, my family now, that by the time that we would meet again, we would have done great things in life. So that's just like a little bit of my experiences during my study abroad experience in London. So moving forward back at Claflin University, back in Orangeburg, but in, back in South Carolina, what I kind of did is I focused on helping everyone find their passion, finding their roots, like, Finding what is the main what is the main source of your passion and why do you want to do it? For example, for me, I'm really passionate on helping high school students apply for college because when I was applying to college or universities back when I was a high school, even though I got accepted to almost 25 different universities and almost got a million dollars in scholarship, it, I didn't really have that someone or a mentor to help me guide me through the process and pretty much reviewing all my applications, telling me what needs to be done. And as a first gen college student, that was really difficult and I hope to make a change for the future generation. So because of this, 
because of all the things that I have done gradually around the campus community, I became the president of Global Student Organization, which is an organization pretty much full of international students and students who wants to learn more about international cultures. We do a lot of events around the campus community about a global night, spreading different intercultural awareness and stuff like that. I was also part of the uh, team leader of the Up to Us challenge or community challenge by Net Impact. And it is a competition sponsored by Net Impact that revolves around fiscal literacy, financial literacy, the national debt, and pretty much sustainability. I was also a proud ambassador of National Sales Network, HBCU Venture Capital, which is a fellowship aimed for minorities on breaking through the startups or venture capital industry. I was also part of the NABA or Nas National Association of Black Accountants and NSB or National S Society of Black Engineers. So, you know, you must be wondering in all these roles, how did the Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship prepared me for all these responsibilities? Because I was also working part-time as a writing center consultant and I was also taking around 20 college credits. So that was insane. And my answer is that this fellowship helped me prepare for this by exposing me to the fun side of juggling multiple responsibilities or what they would like to call in the corporate world, project management. So for example, um, back when I was in London, my friend and I were planning a weekend getaway in Scotland. And if you think about it, there is a lot of responsibilities that goes around with this, you know, we had to make an itinerary per day because it's a moment of a lifetime. We're going there like who, like who knows when would be the next time we we're, we're going to come back, you know? We made sure that we would be visiting the most iconic and the most popular landmarks. We made sure that we had a place to stay that is close to the main attractions, but at the same time also affordable. We made sure that we had our transportation, what we are going to eat, making sure that we have enough funds for all these places, but also enough for souvenirs to take back home with us. And pretty much that includes a lot of processes. And even before studying abroad, you know, as students, we have to pack a lot because this fellowship is around six to eight weeks or even more than that. We had to prepare our passport, changing new currency. In my situation, it was um, USD to pounds new phone number, and addition to that, the course work that we are doing, which was during my time was intercultural leadership. And that was a lot to handle. And what I, I said fun side, because we get to see, or I get to see the fun side of those things that we have done. So for example, because of the planning that we have spent for going to Scotland, we had a lot of time when we went to Scotland, we even had extra time to hike one of the tallest mountains in Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland, as you can see in the picture, that was like around, I forgot how many uh, the altitude is, but it's really high. It's crazy. It's like around two hours from and back. But yeah, so, you know, moving forward again. So now that I had all this experience, I had all this transferable and leadership skills, I was able to get through the screening process of these companies. And the next part is the interview. And during the interview, studying abroad exposed me to a lot of challenges and a lot of new experiences, which boosted my confidence a lot. It showed to the employers that I had the confidence and the bravery to go out of my own horizons, learn about a new culture, learning about a new lifestyle and have the passion to meet new people and basically throwing myself out there and socialize with everyone. Especially as a Frederick Douglass Global Fellow, we took an intercultural leadership course um, hosted by Papa Q or Quinton Redcliffe and Dr. Keisha Abraham. And man, that was really helpful in regards of learning how to collaborate effectively in an international landscape or in, in an international environment. It prepared me to answer questions such as, tell me about a time you made a mistake. Tell me about a time you taught someone how to do something. Tell me about a time where you took an initiative to implement change. And in almost all of those questions, I was able to relate it to me studying abroad and those experiences that I have garnered and how it tied directly to my personal development 
not only my professional development and employers love that because they want to see the original or authentic you and lastly i would also like to mention that this fellowship helped me identify and develop my own sense of personal identity which shapes my future career or personal goals five years to 10 years from now. Because of the experiences that have experienced in London, I am really proud to call myself now a proud Filipino. I'm proud to call myself a proud first gen college student. And I'm really proud to say that I'm really passionate on integrating finance and technology to create some type of banking and financial literary platform for underprivileged communities starting at my own hometown in Philippines because I grew up in a community where there is a lot of small businesses that is being taken advantage by the government because these people didn't have the knowledge or the financial knowledge to protect themselves and the technology to accelerate their processes. And I'm really proud to also say that probably two to three years from now, I'm thinking of creating a mentorship program for high school students that help them not only get accepted to their dream universities, but also with a full scholarship. Because again, when I was growing up, I didn't have that someone, a mentor, to help me guide through the process. And being part of this fellowship, it helped me identify the gaps in my life or the moments where I felt hopeless the most and be able to tackle those situations and make a change for the next generation. And as my ending remarks, you know, I really hope that you all apply to this program. Make sure to show your authentic self. Make sure to show the real you. And do not be ashamed of who you are because that will make you special and unique. You guys got this. And make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. It's my social media handles are down or in the slide. LinkedIn, Frederick Uy, Instagram, Frederick.Uy, or my email. And I'd be more than happy to answer you guys' question, ranging from the fellowship or to anything pretty much else. Thank you. Wow, Frederick. Thank you so much for those inspiring remarks. You described so beautifully the benefits of this experience. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for sharing your information out there so others can get in contact with you. It was wonderful to have you here. Uh, next slide, please. For our final five minutes or so, I want to share just a few details about this summer's program and the application, and then we'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. In previous years, the fellows went to Cape Town or London, as Frederick did, but this year something very exciting happened, as Dr. Pello referred to. The, doc the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland, whom we have a relationship with, contacted us because they wanted to celebrate the 175th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's tour of Ireland. And in case you're not familiar, Frederick Douglass was there in 1845. It was really a transformative experience for him. He couldn't believe how friendly everyone was. It was such a relief for him to be away from America's racism. And I hear students of color say that today about their study abroad experience. A great quote from Frederick Douglass on this is, I came here a thing, I go back a human being. I came here maligned and despised, I go back with reputation and celebrity. So the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs is really excited about commemorating this journey and its impact, which will lead to some wonderful opportunities for the fellows. As Dr. Pello mentioned, the foreign minister who's pictured there is interested in meeting with the fellows and perhaps the ambassador and other, and other dignitaries as well, which is so fitting given the fact that Frederick Douglass was a diplomat in addition to everything else. And it's been wonderful to learn just how much the Irish revere Frederick Douglass, because I didn't know. They've got a whole week of activities, the second week of February called Douglass Week. They're trying to name streets after him in Cork, so they're not messing around. And the fellows will get to walk in his footsteps and visit some of the cities where he campaigned, like Cork and Wexford and Belfast. And we're excited about the host city for other reasons as well. Ireland is a lot more diverse than it used to be. Pictured on the right is Fanula, I hope I'm saying that correctly, O'Reilly, who was Miss Ireland in the Miss Universe competition last year. She's the first multicultural woman to represent Ireland in the pageant. That changing demographic is causing interesting conversations about race and Irish identity and how people of color are treated. The image on the bottom is of a Black Lives Matter protest 
after George Floyd's murder. And we hope to introduce you to those involved in that movement as well. And lastly, how much fun is Ireland? I mean, we all know his reputation for fun. I had one of the best nights of my life in Dublin. Don't worry, I won't bore you with the details. Let's just say folks are super friendly and I'm sure you're gonna have a good time. Next slide, please. A bit more about what the program entails. As a fellow, you will take the intercultural communication and leadership course that Frederick referred to. And the lead faculty for that program is indeed Quentin Redcliffe. Uh, we refer to him as Papa Q, I think because he just makes you feel better about yourself <laughs> and the world. He is our Director of Diversity of Inclusion, and he is flying over from Cape Town, South Africa, where he is based to teach the fellows. You will learn about current cultural and political themes in Ireland and explore the experiences of diverse populations. You'll also learn key intercultural communication frameworks and leadership practices that deepen your cultural self-awareness and help you to effectively communicate with culturally different others. And isn't that a skill we need these days? Complementing your coursework will be a variety of activities and excursions like trips to those other cities in Ireland and meetings with local community leaders. To learn more about what the fellows experience, I'd recommend watching some of the videos that they produced at the end of the program, which are on our website. Fredericks is brilliant, so check that out. Next slide, please. Lastly, some tips for the application, which consists of a transcript, a letter of recommendation, and a video. Make sure you request your letter of recommendation. How about now? Well in advance of the deadline of February 14th. We need to receive the letter by the deadline, so don't ask for it on the deadline. As far as the video, don't stress about the production value of the video. You don't need to be Spike Lee. Recording a well-written speech with a camera on your phone will do just fine. And this is really an opportunity to tell your story. As Frederick says, to show your authentic self. If we could interview you in person, we would, but we can't. So the video is the next best thing to show us who you are. We do provide some suggestions as well for what you can address in the video. And that's in the application. A common question is, what are you looking for from applicants? And we are looking for future Frederick Douglasses. Frederick Douglass really valued an education since he was denied it. So we're looking for high academic achievers. Frederick Douglass was a gifted orator and we're looking for applicants with good public speaking skills. And Frederick Douglass was an activist. So we are looking for students who value service and who want to create positive change in their communities. Next slide, please. There will be lots of you who meet that criteria. And we wish we could give a full scholarship to all of you, but we can't. Not yet, anyway. I'm waiting for Oprah to discover us and give us a big donation, but she's not answering my calls. The good news is, if you meet the eligibility requirements and complete that application, you'll receive a partial scholarship of $1,500. And the students who have taken advantage of that opportunity, we call our Frederick Douglass Summer Scholars. You can use that scholarship towards any CIEE program, Paris was the most popular destination last time round, and I had the pleasure of taking that wonderful photo. But there's lots of other destinations to choose from as well. Next slide, please. You can study sustainability in Costa Rica, Spanish in Barcelona, Ghanaian studies in Accra, or do an internship in Tokyo, and many other options. That $1,500 covers a portion of the fee. The obvious question is, where can you get the rest of that fee? And I can share what worked for students last time around. You can apply for the Gilman Scholarship, that's G-I-L-M-A-N. Ask your study abroad office about how you can apply for that and some tips for it. They should be familiar. Or you can do a fundraising campaign or your church or sorority might have funds or your school might have funds. So there's funding out there. Talk to your study abroad office, make your plan B. I certainly hope that some of you on this call are chosen as a fellow and come to Dublin. But if not, a month in Barcelona or Lisbon or Tokyo is pretty fabulous as well. And next slide. We're also working on a series of workshops that every student who completes an application can participate in. So we'll have sessions on funding study abroad, going abroad as a student of color, using video and photography to capture your experience. And my personal favorite, a comparative look at activism in different countries. We'll have student activists from DC, 
Cape Town, Accra, and Santiago lined up for that. And the last slide, please. That is all, folks. We are here for any questions that you may have. I'm going to check the chat box now. I did see that one that came in was, um, will we get to meet Nettie Washington Douglas? Uh, and the answer is, we really hope so. She's excited about the possibility of meeting with you. Nothing is confirmed yet, but, we, but she has certainly indicated a desire to meet with this class of fellows, as she has done in the past. She was at our opening ceremony, and she's met with two of the classes. Uh, another question that I saw was, when will the program take place? Uh, July 12th, I believe, is the start date, and it's for four weeks, starting on July 12th. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Are we recording it? Yes, we are, and we will send the recording to anyone who has registered for it. Oh, here we go. Uh, does the recommendation letter have to come from a college professor or can it come from an academic advisor? It can come from an academic advisor. I would choose someone who knows you best and can speak to who you are and what your leadership potential is. What if our school has canceled study abroad? Are you still eligible? As far as we're concerned, yes, but you should have a conversation with your study abroad office to see if the credits that you would earn on this program, um, to see if you'd be able to earn those credits that you would earn. So we do have some students who are taking part in the program, even though their schools have suspended study abroad, but you should definitely have a conversation with your study abroad office about that. Uh, the best way to answer the question for the video. Um, what's the best way? The best way is to answer it honestly and to say how you feel. <laughs> um, what if you're not experienced enough to answer some of the questions? Um, I think I would choose the questions that speak most to you. I think there is one which says, let me look it up right now. What do you hope to get out of this experience? So I think that that's a question that you could answer even if you don't have a lot of experience already. Uh, something I'd recommend as well is look at what other students have done. If you go on YouTube and type in Frederick Douglass Global Fellowship, you'll see a host of videos from past applicants. So it might be helpful to look at some of those as well. How do you submit the recommendation letter? There is a form and you will put input the name of your recommender and they will then receive an email that asks them to submit it, which is why you should do it well in advance of time. Uh, all right, I'm skipping some questions, I apologize. Are you? Eligible if you are a senior. I'm afraid you are not eligible if you are a senior. Why? Our hope is that you go back to your campuses for at least another year, telling everybody how much of a wonderful time you had, and then can enroll other students to study abroad as well. So that's the reason why we have that requirement. I think I got to most of the questions. If you think of uh, other questions, here is where to find us. I just wanna take a moment to see if any of our, my fellow presenters have any final words they may wanna say. I'll, I'll, I'll invite um, Frederick to go first cause he was dynamite. So Frederick, do you have any final words of advice for your uh, potential future alums that you'll be meeting on alumni reunions for the fellows? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, as I've mentioned before, definitely do your best in your application. 
um, someone asked before, if you don't have any experiences, try to draw experiences, experiences from your childhood. You know, as I've mentioned before, in regards of project management, I was able to draw it from my experiences in planning a weekend getaway in Scotland. It can be something simple as that, but the long-term benefits that it brings, it can bring you to places. So good luck everyone who's going to apply. And thank you for attending. Thank you, Frederick, and thank you for joining us. You're, you're spectacular and, and true credit to the program. Uh, it's a wonderful example of, of one who walks in the footsteps of Frederick Douglass. Uh, Colin, any final words of, uh, of assuring that you will keep folks safe and healthy and informed on any travel restrictions or requirements for vaccines or any of the yeah. information that we all set there? Yeah, I, I, thank you, Jim. I saw you answered with the one vaccine question. And uh, yeah, just uh, we'll definitely be communicating with you all, um, you know, as, as requirements change. And yes, the, the whole, not, not only is the whole situation fluid, but the vaccine situation is fluid. And, and certainly um, it wouldn't make sense in a, in a case where, you know, the, the vaccine levels are still low where you're coming from and low where you're going to require a vaccine. So I think we're, we're still looking at a bit of time before that comes. But thank you. As Jim said, we'll communicate with you as requirements change, travel requirements change, and they, they change quite often, as Jim said. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, my, my closing comments are um, similar to my opening comments. It, this, this program is, uh, is a fabulous program in lots of ways, not the least of which that it's free. Uh, so we basically pay for everything. We'll fly you over there, we'll house you, we'll feed you. We have amazing speakers and faculty members that will be flying up from the other side of the earth, up from Cape Town. Um, Quentin Redcliffe is, is superb um, at leading students through uh, an evolution of finding themselves and finding their strength and their voice and their uniqueness and their identities and uh, helping them really put fuel in the tank to go out and change the world in positive ways. Uh, he's done it for us for 20 years. Actually, I learned this yesterday was Quentin's 20th anniversary at CIEE. So this guy is, uh, he, he would be one of your favorite professors in your college career. Uh, he's, he's hosted and, and um, nurtured and mentored so many students over the years from all over the world. Um, and, and I would say that, uh, if not selected as a fellow, uh, we will have hundreds of applications. Uh, the Summer Scholars Program is, is an excellent uh, alternative. It's a grant of $1,500 from us, as Stacy mentioned. Also, many of your colleges have college presidents who have matched it. We have, um, last year we had over 50 college presidents agree to match the grant. So that was $3,000 on a CIEE program. That program is of your choice. We'll have uh, this year we'll have about a dozen, but sometimes we have as many as 30 programs in the summer when it's not a COVID year. Uh, and they could be academic topics uh, of your choosing in locations of your choosing. Also a great uh, opportunity to experience the world and climb that mountain. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll close by saying um, lots of the questions have to do with uh, the mechanics of the application. Don't let it get in your way. Uh, if you can't figure out how to attach the video or how to create a video, uh, we have simplified it uh, supremely uh, to make it easy for you. If you have any questions, just reach out to Stacy. She'll walk you right through it and get your application right in. Um, the references, we want to know who you are. So if you can get to the president, get to the president or the dean or your coach or someone who knows you, a faculty member who knows you. Uh, many of you are online. Don't worry. Uh, reach out to your professors online. Have them craft a simple word doc of how great you are and, and how impressed they are with you. And and forward it along with your application. Um, and then finally, uh, I, I would um, encourage all of you, uh, especially this year, uh, if, you're, if you've experienced history the way we have experienced history uh, this year, uh, we're, we're even more committed uh, to access and opportunity, uh, to creating change agents who will go out and lead uh, their communities, their families, their businesses, perhaps become politicians or police officers or military leaders, wherever you wind up in life, school teachers, wherever you wind up in life, uh, we hope to play a small role in your development by providing you this opportunity uh, to go abroad, climb that mountain, find yourselves uh, and bring back some skills and experiences that will serve you well uh, for the next 50 years, which is what happened to Frederick Douglass. When he returned a free man, he continued to work as a special advisor to leaders and governors and President Lincoln for 50 years, right up until he passed. Um, so it's an experience that launched Frederick and it's an experience I know that will launch you all. 
Um, so please complete those applications. Let your friends know also uh, about the, the program and reach out if you have any questions at all. Thank you for your interest. Congratulations on all the great things you've done already in your life. Uh, and we look forward to being with many of you this coming summer. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.